From the Las Vegas Review-Journal studio, welcome to Season 3, Episode 7 of Mobbed Up, The Fight for Las Vegas, presented by Pro Group Management. Additional sponsorship provided by the Golden Steer. John Katsalamidis here. As always, I want to give you a quick warning that this podcast contains explicit content, such as strong language and depictions of violence, including murder. Please be advised this podcast might not be suitable for all audiences. Oscar Goodman is a man known for being many things. An outspoken mayor of Las Vegas, a family man, a museum co-creator, but perhaps most of all, he's known for his ties as the mouthpiece to the mob, having represented clients for nearly 40 years as an attorney. With a career that long, anyone is bound to ruffle some feathers. And throughout this series, you've heard from several people who have strong opinions about him. Former officials, My name is Jeff Silver. I'm a retired attorney, and uh, I was a member of the Nevada Gaming Control Board. Officers. My name is Mike Powell. I'm a retired Los Angeles police officer and former chief investigator for Intercept in Hollywood, California. Journalists. My name is Jane Ann Morrison. I had worked for the Review Journal for so many years, both as a political reporter, uh, and I covered Oscar in the uh, federal court system. And family members of the mob. My name's Meyer Lansky II, and my grandfather was the original Meyer Lansky, and I represent his history here. Today, he gets to hear what they've said about him, and in true Oscar fashion, give his closing arguments. All right, Oscar, we're going to be talking to uh, and hearing from, we have talked to and heard from people who have known you over the years, who've... Uh, That's good and bad. ...worked uh, uh, on your bench and uh, on the other side of the diamond, as we say. We're going to start with uh, your friend and our friend, uh, the uh, Las Vegas author, Jack Sheehan. Good guy. Who has chronicled uh, especially Good guy. Good guy. the Jimmy Shagra case. So yes. Let's, uh, let's hear what Jack has to say. The story is so amazing, it's almost hard to believe. But Jimmy's older brother, Lee Shagra, who was eight years older than Jimmy, was a contemporary of Oscar Goodman's. And Oscar, in my interviewing with Oscar, he's, Oscar speaks very highly of Lee Shagra and says he was probably the number one criminal drug defense attorney in the country. So you imagine the irony. Here's one of the top drug defense attorneys in the country operating out of El Paso, and his eight years younger brother, Jimmy, Jamil is his real name, was the biggest drug smuggler in North America. What an odd brother combination this is. You got Cain and Abel. It's almost biblical, and you've got the Think of the Godfather saga and the good brothers and the bad brothers in the Corleone family. That's very good. What are your thoughts? Is he on the mark with that? Oh, he's absolutely on the mark. When uh, Jimmy uh, uh, had been incarcerated, uh, Jack went down to the institution and they made a deal. And uh, Jack actually had quite a bit of money contributed to what I consider to be the potential for the greatest movie in the history of mankind. This is a movie that would have been and I love Casino. I, I, there's nothing I didn't like about it. But it was Casino. It was Goodfellows. It was uh, uh, the one with um, Pacino uh, as the uh, Cuban-American uh, drug dealer. Forget the name of it. Uh, down in Miami. Scarface. Scarface. It had all of the elements of that. It had the elements of sex. It had the elements of gambling. It had uh, murder. It had adventure. And for some reason, uh, Jack is... Uh, trying to uh, get a group together to really get this on. Uh, I don't know why somebody doesn't grab it. I I would think that Scorsese uh, would make this into the greatest movie that anybody ever saw, and everybody in the world would see it. It's just a phenomenal story. Uh, I had met Lee. Lee wanted to hire me, actually, uh, to uh, represent him against the the judge who was ultimately assassinated down there, uh, Maximum John Wood, uh, because Wood would give uh, uh, Lee's Lee didn't win every case that he had. In those cases that he didn't win, the judge would give him, give his clients um, the maximum sentence. So that's why he was known as Maximum John. And he was assassinated on May the 29th of 1979. And uh, Lee uh, was uh, killed uh, shortly thereafter uh, on the uh, Sun Bowl Sunday uh, following that. And um, never had the chance to file a lawsuit, but it would have been a, a very interesting lawsuit. And I, of course, represented Jimmy and got an acquittal for him. Uh, which is pretty extraordinary since it was uh, designated the, the crime of the century. Like a lot of celebrated criminals in American history, Jimmy Shagra was a mixture of good and bad. His family loved him. Law enforcement hated him. 
The people who worked with him in smuggling liked him and respected him. The people who were burned in bad drug deals hated him. He was charming, charismatic, funny, dangerous. He was all those things that we look for in, if you will, cinematic bad guys. This ring was given to me by Jimmy Chagra uh, as that's a, a four card diamond. And um, when I won the case, he had somebody bring it by my office and say that uh, Jimmy wanted you to have this. And uh, he said to the media at the time the jury came back, thank God for Oscar Goodman. And uh, we always had a, a great relationship up until the very end. And he uh, he died a pauper, which is a, a very interesting when he got out of prison for another offense that he was found guilty of that I did not represent him on. Uh, he actually uh, uh, lived in a trailer in Arizona. And I think that's where Jack Sheehan went down to make the deal with him. And he got married and he was relatively happy, actually. And then they came up to my law office and I've got pictures of Jimmy. And matter of fact, on my wall here down at Oscar's restaurant, I have a picture of Jimmy uh, walking out of court with me and where he says, uh, thank God for that victory and thank God for Oscar. So, yeah, it was a big win, but they're all big wins, as I say. I had the privilege of bringing Jimmy Shagra into Oscar's office when he was mayor. We have pictures of it uh, and reuniting those two guys who hadn't seen each other in 25 years. And I can tell you, it brought me to tears. There were these two old guys who had had a meaningful moment in each other's lives. In Oscar's case, it was maybe the victory of his career as a defense attorney. In Jimmy's case, Oscar saved him from the death penalty. Oscar saved my life. Jimmy told me that on the record several times. And these two guys hugged and were teary-eyed. And I asked them if they wanted me to leave the office. They said, no, you can stay here. You you made this meeting happen. Oh, oh I remember it well. You know, it was a, it was a poignant moment uh, in my life. And it was a meaningful experience uh, with uh, Jack and uh, Jimmy in my office. But it brought back the uh, the sad part about uh, the case. Uh, you know, uh, every case has uh, sad parts and happy parts. Uh, it was happy for me and for Jimmy that the jury came back with an acquittal. It was very sad for me when uh, Liz Chagra, and they lived across the street from me, by the way, when uh, uh, they both went to prison on another matter and uh, uh, Liz uh, was in prison, and Jimmy said, Oscar, do me one favor. I, he was always thinking about Liz. They had their issues, uh, but they had a lot of children together as well. And he says, uh, do whatever you can to get her out. Uh, do whatever you can. As a matter of fact, Jimmy uh, uh, pled guilty to the attempted assassination of the prosecutor in the case. And uh, he did that with the understanding that the government was going to go to the judge, William Sessions, who was no bargain. I promise you that and uh, get uh, the sentence that Liz got, a 30-year sentence, reduced to either 10 or 20 years. It really doesn't matter that much. Once you're in and you're spending that much time, you really come back uh, a different change uh, kind of person. And uh, Jimmy uh, waited for me to leave town. <laughs> and uh, then he hired a, a public defender, actually. And uh, the public defender pled him guilty. And poor Liz got uh, nothing out of it, didn't cut her sentence at all. And when she was in prison, uh, the only visitors she really had were her, her daughters and her, her son. And uh, she was very ill. Uh, she had uh, cervical cancer, and uh, she was dying quickly, if there is such a thing. The handwriting was on the wall. I even got uh, a prison doctor, and this is almost impossible to get, uh, come forward uh, during a court hearing to say that time was short for her. I can't tell you when, he said, but uh, she certainly is very, very ill. And uh, the FBI agent, who was the agent in charge of getting Liz and uh, he called me and he said, look, you're right. Enough is enough. Uh, I'd be happy to help you try to get her out. And the two of us became friends, which is remarkable. Hmm. And the FBI agent and myself drove down to a clemency hearing and we made our argument and uh, they wouldn't let her out. And she passed away in prison with her uh, children waiting for her to come home on a, uh, a compassionate release. Didn't make it. And I was heartbroken about that because uh, Liz was a victim of circumstances. Jimmy was a very dominant a domineering person. And uh, he, when he said, do something, Liz did it. Uh, and um, yeah, all she did, and uh, you know, it was something. She delivered uh, the money to the uh, the hitman or the person who was alleged to be the hitman, who was Charles Harrelson, uh, Woody Harrelson's uh, mm -hmm. uh, father. And uh, 
didn't know what was in the briefcase when she left it at a, a hotel room. And that was the extent of her involvement. But uh, she wrote a letter when the case was starting uh, to the judge's widow. And she says, dear Mrs. Wood, I'm a uh, born again Christian or reborn Christian, whatever the, the phraseology is. And I want to let you know I had nothing to do with uh, the killing of your husband. All I can say is uh, my husband came into the kitchen and said that I'm going to kill me a federal judge. And that was the end of uh, Liz Shagra because she tried him. And I was able to get the case severed. So I tried Jimmy all by himself while everybody else was found guilty. Jimmy was found not guilty. We talked also, Oscar, to the attorney, um, Stan Hunter, and about his uh, experiences in, uh, in uh, dealing with you. I hadn't been in town too long, but I'd, I'd been here long enough to know who Oscar was and who all the other major players were. And uh, he said, uh, tell me what you know about this guy, Oscar. And the agent, who sadly is no longer with us, described Oscar the way you might expect an FBI agent to describe Oscar in a very strong language, which I won't repeat here. But uh, I obviously didn't like Oscar. Okay. And then the agent said, without missing a beat, now his wife, Carolyn's a whole nother story. What she'd really like to do is move to Israel and live on a kibbutz. So I, I knew right away from that brief description that this was an interesting kind of couple. I, I never got to know them socially. I, I never had anything against Oscar. For me, it was business. For him, I always got the feeling it was much more personal. Well, Stan, Stan's right about one thing, and that is it was very personal with me. I took all these cases personally. I took my relationship, or lack thereof, uh, with uh, these uh, fellows who were involved with the government very, very personally. I never had a beef with Stan. I, I couldn't understand why somebody like him would be part of what's called the uh, strike force, which is a, a group of uh, lawyers basically uh, sent out from Washington to do a number uh, in, in lieu of uh, a, a regular Las Vegan uh, who was uh, with the U.S. Attorney's Office. They didn't need any help from Washington. And I can't tell you that uh, Stan and I were uh, uh, enemies. Uh, I can't think of a case right now where uh, we uh, faced each other in the courtroom. I know that uh, he was a, a person who held himself out as a straight shooter. But um, I, I got no beef with him. I have no beef with his wife. I have no beef with his two sons. Uh, one went, I think they were West Point. They were pretty accomplished people. But as far as what he was doing for a living, it stunk uh, because um, he was representing a bunch of FBI agents at the time who were outlaws. Okay, we've, Oscar, we've talked about your relationship with the FBI. Now we are going to hear from Mike Powell, who is a, an LAPD officer who was part of what is known as the Zebra Unit on the uh, Tony Spilatro case. He never went undercover, but he met Spilatro and was the only undercover operative in the Spilatro case. Well, uh, if he tells you that, he's a bunch of hooey. Uh, and I'm being nice about it. There was a person who actually infiltrated uh, uh, Tony's uh, confidences by the name of uh, Rick Bacon. Let's hear what Mike had to say. What happened is I got a call and Oscar Goodman and his team got the case thrown out of court for illegal search and seizure because they seized all these documents. And what they got, the, uh, they busted them for was not only wire fraud, mail fraud, but they got them for money laundering and IRS tax evasion. I mean, it was a big, widespread bust. And um, the local judge here said that the warrant didn't specifically state anything to do with the IRS or money laundering or anything. So they threw the whole case out. So the federal government appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is pretty liberal. And they upheld the case, saying that in the process of searching for wire and mail fraud, if you run across money laundering and other things, other criminal activities, that it was legal if you ran across them. And so it was upheld and um, the business was shut down. I, I don't know what world uh, this Mr. Powell uh, lived in, but uh, the lesson to be learned from that search and seizure was that the judge who was brought in from Los Angeles, who heard the case, when he heard what the government had done at the gold rush and at Tony's home and on his person, he said, 
what the government has done here, what the FBI has done here is what the revolutionary war was fought over, uh, that the king was not able uh, to invade uh, the uh, rights of uh, the, the citizens. And that's why it was thrown out, not because of some stupid technicality. As you know, um, Oscar, we talked to uh, one of the journalists who covered you for decades for the Review Journal, who was with, the, with our publication on and off for about 40 years, Jane Ann Morrison. And uh, here's some of what she had to recall about um, about covering you. I have to give credit to an FBI agent by the name of Mark Casper. Oh, my God. The Mob Museum did a very good job. Um, let me get the date here. The Mob Museum did a very good job, and it was November 12th of 2015. And Mark Casper basically rebutted many of the things that Oscar said. They were both on the panel at the same time. Oscar said that Spilatro didn't curse, that he and Jerry Rosenthal didn't have an affair, and that Rosenthal was not an FBI informant, and Claiborne did not leak FBI wiretap information to the mob. Mark Casper disputed all four of those claims. Well, the funny part about it is Mark Castro was a pretty decent guy. He was very friendly with uh, my uh, secretary. And if uh, Mark Casper uh, takes the position that um, I was misrepresenting something, I, I, I don't think he'd do that to my face. I don't recall. And I, I don't like people who say I don't recall. Uh, I do recall that at the end of the night, I shook Mark Casper's hand uh, at the Mob Museum, and I wouldn't have done that uh, with the average FBI agent and wished him well. And uh, I still wish him well. Have you talked to Casper since that session? I I think I did, yeah. He called me when he came to down to say hi. How's that? Uh, I'm just telling you, it's an interesting thing. Yeah, I mean, here's an FBI agent calling me to say hi. When Mark Casper went head to head with Oscar Goodman, uh, Goodman had said that Spilatro didn't curse. Well, they have him on wiretaps cursing up a storm. So, you know, anybody who saw Casino knew that that there was some cussing going on. Oh, that's a good source. Let's see. He, uh, Oscar said that he and Jerry Rosenthal didn't have an affair. Well, the FBI has video pictures of them meeting. So that was Oscar might not have known that. I'll give him credit for that. Uh, thank you, Jane. For him to say that it didn't happen, that's another falsehood. Um, he, a, again, he insisted that Rosenthal was not an FBI informant and that Claiborne did not uh, leak wi FBI wiretap information to the mob. And uh, Casper was in a position to know, and he, he just basically disputed all four of those points. For some reason, she didn't like me, and I was a handsome lawyer. Uh, I was a bon vivant lawyer. I was a lawyer that people liked to get close to, that they wanted to be friendly with. But for some reason, she kept on going. The truth of the matter is, if that's what she's talking about, I never heard him use an epithet about my religion. I mean, if he didn't like a Jewish person, he wouldn't have used a Jewish person. Everybody in town wanted to represent him. Everybody in the country wanted to represent him. He was the most important guy at the time to be representing because he was the man. And he chose me, and I took it as a badge of honor. So I don't know what she's talking about as far as that's concerned. Uh, I know this. I know that he was always nice to the people who cared uh, about me and who I cared about. And uh, I, I swear on a stack of Bibles, and I'll do it right now, that I swear on everything dear to me that I had no idea that there was a relationship. She also has uh, referenced wiretaps, which are real. Well, uh, uh, yeah, not... but I wasn't listening to him. So how am I supposed to know? Uh, she was the third intrusive year. I wish she had written some stories about it so I could have refuted it then, not now. We'll move on, Oscar, to someone who does have a, a, a more favorable um, uh I haven't heard anything unfavorable, John. <laughs> I mean, I, I really haven't. I'm delighted with the way this is turning we'll, out. We'll, we'll, These people are real fans. That said, we'll go to another fan. Uh, this is uh, Meyer Lansky the second, who's the grandson. I don't know the gentleman. His grandson and I don't know uh, him. Okay, of uh, Meyer Lansky. Oh, I represented Meyer yeah. Lansky, but and, I, I and don't know the Meyer second. Is in that community, and had uh, had this to say about uh, you and his grandfather. Oh, I, I can't wait to hear this. 
Well, Oscar Goodman's a huge fan of the mob. There's, there's no doubt about that. He built, you know, he put together the whole uh, for ten years now. We've had at the uh, uh, mob museum with all the memorabilia and everything like that, and he he loves that. And I, I you know, it is a fantastic history. He's done a great job preserving the history. He's the one that did it. I mean, with that museum, it's incredible. You know, and it's able to now expand into which I really prefer um, into the other crime organizations around the world. Uh, I did not know Meyer Lansky personally. I was retained to represent him here in Nevada, but didn't have the privilege of uh, representing him uh, face to face. I still have the check, I believe, that he sent me, retaining me. And um, the truth of the matter is, and, and, and this is what people forget, and this is why I wear these things as a badge of honor. These people that uh, all the pro-government, so to speak, participants here, uh, think of something uh, untoward or unseemly about me representing them. To me, it was a badge of honor. These uh, My clients could afford anybody in the world. They retained me to make sure that the government was going to do their job right, that the Constitution was going to be followed, that if the government breached their obligation and engaged in misconduct, that they would be punished for it, and that's the way the system is supposed to work. So I am proud of the fact that I represented Tony Spilatro, that I represented Meyer Lansky, that I represented Jimmy Shagra, uh, and uh, that I never was in a federal case and let them refute this, where I didn't catch an FBI agent in a lie. Don't get scared, folks. Mobbed Up, the fight for Las Vegas, will be back after this. Can't get enough of the intrigue, drama, and excitement behind the history of Las Vegas? Live it by dining at the Golden Steer Steakhouse, the oldest steakhouse in Las Vegas and an old haunt of Tony Spilatro's. You know, the guy from the podcast you're listening to. The Golden Steer has been serving up famous and infamous customers since 1958, from mobsters to the Rat Pack, Muhammad Ali to Holly Madison. Enjoy this classic experience in person or try their world-famous best steaks on earth in the comfort of your own home by ordering today at goldensteerlasvegas.com. During our time recording this season of Mobbed Up, we heard from many guests. We wanted to give Oscar the opportunity to hear what some of them had to say. The good, the challenging, and everything in between. Here's Jeff Silver, former attorney and Nevada Gaming Control Board member, recalling his interactions with some of Goodman's most notorious clientele. Frank Lefty Rosenthal and Tony Spilatro. Rosenthal himself was not a nice man in terms of how he conducted his activities in the casino. Uh, if looks could kill, I was dead 15 times over as he was staring at me. But the fact of the matter is that he did have this association with Tony Spilatro, who was a, a known assassin at that time. Oh, please, a known assassin. Silver sounds like an FBI agent. Shame on them. Shame on him. Shame on Silver. Uh, I heard, okay, uh, with as much reliability as what he was using for his hearsay proclamations, I heard he was on the take. And the very guys he's criticizing were the ones who were providing the money. Now, how does that feel, Jeff? You know, you can say whatever you want in this day and age. I think I'm a woke person. I don't know. But you can say whatever you want. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to go under oath. Uh, you're a public figure, so they can't sue you. So watch yourself, Jeff. The list of excluded persons is not something that the agency takes lightly because a person is excluded from any any appearance inside of a casino. And uh, it's a gross misdemeanor for them to do so. So it's a criminal offense. And casinos can, in fact, lose their licenses as a result of that. I think that the issue that really put Rosenthal over the top in terms of his nomination into the Black Book was the subsequent disclosures about what was really going on under his tutelage at the, at the casino. I look at the Stardust experience and my role with Frank Rosenthal as being uh, playing a, a puzzle. And every time I make an appearance with someone, uh, it may be a, a former intelligence officer from the Metropolitan Police Department, or it might be a reporter. They say things that I hadn't heard before. And uh, they had little pieces of the puzzle that, you know, only now I'm putting together as to what was really going on. Now. Jeff, I thought you were smarter than that. You're saying that uh, 
It's not a big deal to be nominated. All you have to do is say, I want this person in the black book. You don't have to have any proof of anything. The person doesn't have to do anything wrong. You just don't like him. Uh, there are no standards. I feel you're way out of line. And the truth of the matter is, if uh, all the monkeys who were on the gaming control board at the time uh, realized that the more deadly weapon than somebody entering into a casino uh, would be able to take would be a phone calling from the outside. So uh, to me, you're a bunch of phonies. We also found never before heard audio from season one of Mobbed Up, where Frank Collada, the late ex mobster, recalled a particular interaction with Oscar. The two had a long standing feud until Collada's death in 2020. When's the last time you talked to him? Last time he was putting my tie on my neck. <laughs> I had him tie a knot, and Tony and I were standing there. It was years and years ago. And that was the last time, God, I can't even remember. I was free and I was walking around Vegas and I had court dates many, many years ago. So you, he represented you for a little while at least, right? Yeah, he did. That's why he couldn't, uh, that's why they wouldn't allow him to cross-examine me in court because he represented me. He will never admit it, but then why couldn't he cross-examine me? So, you know, it only proves I was right. Your response to that? To what? To his comments. To Collada's comments, they don't deserve a response. I never represented the fella. Uh, the only thing, as I said, I made a mistake. He was up in John Mamet's office, which is on the floor above mine. And uh, John said, how does Frank look? I said, well, he never looks good, but he should have a little respect for the courts and put a tie on. And uh, Collada looks at uh, uh, Mamet and he says, I don't know how to tie one. I said, give me one of your ties, John, because it, uh, John was a very uh, great, uh, very smooth dresser. And uh, he handed me a tie and I put it around Collada's neck and I made the knot and I pulled and I pulled and I pulled. I just didn't pull hard enough. For most people, a career that spanned more than 30 years representing clients and becoming known worldwide would be enough. But for Oscar Goodman, he set his sights on something more becoming the mayor of Las Vegas, serving three terms. The person right by his side through all of it would be his wife, Carolyn Goodman. My I've, wife is uh, probably the, uh, I could say the cheapest, uh, but the most, <laughs> the most penurious mayor in the history of the world. Oh boy, maybe we need to go back to her. Anyway, we talked to her uh, extensively about you. Here's something, uh, some of what she had to say. People make mistakes in life, everybody. I don't know anybody that hasn't made mistakes. And so whether the, that wasn't the role, his role wasn't to judge them, it was to defend them and made sure that the government was doing its job. We just celebrated our 60th uh, anniversary, wedding anniversary, and um, she's a terrific mother. Uh, she uh, raised the kids virtually by herself because I would leave the house every a Sunday afternoon, uh, she'd drive me to the airport. I'd get on a plane and fly wherever I was trying a case because 90% of my practice was outside of uh, the city of Las Vegas, places like uh, El Paso, San Antonio, Miami, Omaha, Macon. Uh, it didn't matter. It was all over the United States. And uh, she would pick me up on Friday night. Uh, and the two of us would go out to the old bootlegger, which was at uh, Eastern and... Uh, Charleston. No, Eastern Tropicana, I think. Okay. And uh, we'd have a pizza together, and it was like a honeymoon. Uh, every Friday was a honeymoon. And then because of the time differential, because I was always coming from east to west, I uh, would get up uh, early, and uh, everybody was sleeping uh, in the, the house. And I would leave. I'd tiptoe out and go down to my law office and answer all of my mail and get all my messages together. So when I went back uh, to the trial, I would be able to respond to my clients and let them know what was happening. And uh, she uh, never complained. And the children never complained, but uh, Saturday was a special day in our household. I would go to the soccer games. I would go to the uh, uh, viola uh, recitals, the plays at school, the parent-teacher meetings. And I, I took all the children with Carolyn out to dinner Saturday night, and we were a real family, one day of the week at least. And then on Sunday, they all knew that Dad was going out of town again and never, never complained. To him, his purpose, his profession was to protect the rights of all of us. Well, I believed in it. So I never asked anybody, I never asked him, did he tell you he did whatever he's alleged mm -hmm. 
of doing. I never asked because, first of all, he would never say anything, I'm sure, because he believes in the attorney-client privilege. I would never walk on that area with him because it was the purpose of his role as a criminal attorney. And so, you know, it, it never touched us. And the people he represented were so deferential to me and so deferential to the kids. They, uh, she's right on the button there. They, they treated uh, Carolyn like she was a queen and our children like they were uh, royalty and uh, they couldn't do enough for any other when I would leave town. Uh, some of these quote bad guys who we didn't consider to be bad guys because we weren't we weren't moralists. We were uh, uh, she was a, a mother and, and an educator and I was a, a lawyer who tried his cases a lot of, differently than most lawyers. I rarely put my client on the witness stand because they weren't able to do uh, as well as I could. I say this humbly, although I have no humility. Uh, they weren't able to express themselves uh, as well as I could in, in their own behalf. So it was important that uh, I speak for them. And that's where I got the reputation as a mob mouthpiece, because I always represented uh, their uh, position as far as the media was concerned. And we had a mean spirited media at that time. Uh, they were not nice uh, uh, people uh, in the media. And I, I prefer my clients to uh, the media. I prefer my clients uh, to be cry frank with you. Uh, to the FBI at that time, but uh, people would say, well, how can you represent somebody that you know is guilty? Uh, didn't your clients tell you that they were guilty? I said, my clients wouldn't know if they were guilty if they, uh, they tripped over it. The description of you as a great mob historian um, lives on currently in the, in the mob museum. Is that an accurate description well, of you? I don't know about that. All I know is that uh, I'm the last man standing. On episode eight of Mobbed Up, The Fight for Las Vegas, we go back to the beginning with Oscar Goodman. It was a wonderful thing because wherever I went with my father, uh, everybody would say, hello, counselor. Mm -hmm. Good morning, counselor. Good day, mm -hmm. counselor. And he wouldn't take his hat off, but he touched the tip of the hat. And that impressed me. Plus, a never before heard story that hits close to home for the tougher than nails attorney. Uh, she... Uh, she passed away and we got a phone call from the police department there. Uh, are we going to come back? And I was in the middle of a trial. And our guests weigh in on what Goodman's legacy will be long after his days as the mouthpiece for the mob and as the former mayor. Even though he represented these really bad, evil people, somebody had to defend them and, and that's what he did. It's all coming up on the season finale you don't want to miss. This has been Part 7, Season 3 of Mobbed Up, a production of the Las Vegas Review Journal in partnership with the Mob Museum. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to the series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. Also, be sure to leave us a rating or review. Production staff includes Managing Editor Anastasia Hendricks, Producer Kerry Roper, Field and Studio Production by Larry Muir, Sound Design and Mix by Greg Conway. Special thanks to Oscar's Steakhouse in downtown Las Vegas at the Plaza for hosting us on site. To learn more about Mobbed Up, visit lvrj.com backslash podcasts. I'm Las Vegas Review Journal columnist John Katzlamidis. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you on the final episode.